closely. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Showing a reporting of progress and got it, and then we should be okay. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak. It's a, a great pleasure uh, to speak, especially in Ulrika uh, Bingle's lab. I have great, great admiration uh, for Ulrika and her work and have since I first met her at a small meeting organized by the National Institute of Health, as I recall, in uh, Bethesda, Maryland in the US and heard her speak and was super impressed and I remain so. At any rate, um, I have to confess that I love placebos. I've been addicted to placebo research for my whole academic um, I even had to go to a treatment for the addiction where the first step was to admit that I really didn't have a problem and the treatment didn't work and I remain a placebo research. I just can't stop doing it. Why am I addicted to it? I'm addicted to it because of something that happened to me much, much earlier that led me to um, be fascinated by the phenomenon of expectancy. Uh, the purpose of the brain is to anticipate events, said Kenneth Craik, and I read about that uh, some years later. And I also read uh, some years later Dan Dennett's suggestion that the pain is an expectancy machine. And he illustrates that with a story about the sea squirt. Now that's a picture of the sea squirt, and the squeeze, sea squirt swims around the ocean looking for a, when it's young, it swims around the ocean looking for a piece of coral or a rock to which it can attach itself. And for the purpose of doing that, it's got a rudimentary brain. It finds a suitable rock or, or a piece of coral, it attaches itself. And now, since it can't move, since it can't do anything being attached to this rock or coral, it has no need for a brain. And what does it do? It eats its own brain. So there are adaptive functions to expectancies, and one of them is illustrated by the story of the sea squirt, and that is it allows us to adjust our behavior to optimize outcomes. We decide whether to take a particular medication or not, for example. The other thing it does is disambiguous, uh, disambiguate uh, uh, an ambiguous world. I want to try and do one thing here and see if I can, because I have the, uh, you know, it's all right, I'll, I'll manage oh, with that. There we go. So one purpose is disambiguating an, uh, an ambiguous world. And here's an ambiguous uh, figure. Some of you may first see a rat. Some of you may see a human uh, face. Prior exposure, expectancies of what you might see influence what you see. So if you show someone a series of faces like this, one at a time, and then show them the ambiguous figure, 88% of them see a man's face. If instead you first show them pictures of animals and then show them the ambiguous figure, 97% of, of the people then see a rat. Now, the, this, this phenomenon um, has uh, adaptive functions. So for example, if you take a look at this picture, you might see a bunch of twigs, but you also might see that there's a snake in the picture. And if you're walking in the woods and you're anticipating seeing space, uh, uh, snakes, that you, you know that there are snakes in this, in, in this area, you're more likely to see a snake hidden among the twigs than you are if you're not. And that's obviously has survival benefits. But then you can say, well, placebo effects occur in animals. We know that from an early study that Herrenstein did on placebo effects 
in rats back in 1962. Um, but rat animals don't think, do they? As it turns out, expectancies are not confined to humans. And we know that from the work of Edward Chase Tolman, early, early learning theorist, who is what, whose work influenced me and led me to become fascinated by expectancies while I was still an undergraduate some 55 years ago or more. Um, he did most of his studies on rats, or is he just looking at himself in a mirror here? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. He did studies, rat studies, on cognitive maps and expectancies. So one kind of study he did was place learning studies where you teach the animal to navigate a maze and uh, usually use a simple Y maze for that particular one, at least one of the studies on place learning. Um, and what he, he goes through an operant conditioning procedure, the animal learns to take the turn to the right or to the left, where the food is going to be. Um, and what he then does is flood the, the maze with water. So now that the maze is flooded with water, the rat cannot do what it did before. It can't walk to where it goes. What does it do? Does it have to learn all over again? No, it just swims to the correct place in the maze. That argued, uh, Tolman indicates that what the rat has learned is to develop a cognitive map of the environment, in this case of the maze, and an expectancy as to where the food will be found. He also did studies using latent learning as a phenomenon to examine, um, where he would allow rats to just explore a maze um, without any reward at all. And that made it possible for them to learn much more efficiently and quickly once the food was placed, the, the reinforcement was placed, place, uh, placed in the goal box. And I want to describe in a little detail what may be one of my favorite studies of uh, Holman. And that's his study on insight in rats. So he used a maze that looks like this, um, with a start with a food being placed in the goal box and the rat being placed in the start box. And important to understand, this was an elevated maze. So the rat could look around and see things. And he's Let's the rat go, and first the rat goes straight up like this. Number of learning trials, it winds up just doing that immediately. It just runs down the maze straight away after some trials being reinforced in this operant conditioning procedure. Then Tolman placed a barrier on the first path. So now when the rat tries to run, oops, wrong. When the rat tries to run, it hits the barrier, it can't go, it learns to go up path two, avoiding the barrier. And they do enough trials, the rat's doing that consistently every time it's been reinforced for doing that. Then Tolman moved the barrier. Now the question is, on the very first trial, what is the rat going to do? It's been reinforced for taking path one, and extinguished for that and reinforced for pay, taking path two. And now all of a sudden, it's path, both of those paths are blocked, but the rat hasn't had any direct experience. What does it do on the very first trial? It does this. And that Tolman calls insight. The rat was able to look at the maze and somehow figure out that. Uh, the uh, food was at the end. Now, expectancy can be a conscious process, or it can also be a very fast, automatic process without conscious deliberation. This baseball player is trying to catch the ball, 
he has to leap and put his glove out, not where the ball is, but where it's going to be when it reaches him. And that involves an expectation. Where is that ball going to be? It's clearly not something that a human being can do just sitting there. Okay, where's that wall? By that time, it's too late. It has to be quick, and there's no time for uh, conscious deliberation. Um, what did Tolman have to say about that? He wrote, and the ellipses are just shortening it a bit. In spite of the conclusion that practically all behaviors are cognitive, many of these behaviors are automatic and unconscious. For a behavior to be cognitive, it is not necessary that it also be conscious. Hence the distinction between expectations, which is a subset of expectancies. They are expectancies that are held, that are consciously accessible. Before we leave Tolman, who was the greatest inspiration on my very early work and led me to be interested in expectancies and expectancies led me to be interested in placebos. I have to tell you something he wrote in 1945, which I thought was actually, and still think is lovely. He wrote, rats live in cages. They do not go out on binges the night before one has planned an experiment. They don't kill each other off in wars. They do not invent engines of destruction. And if they did, they would not be so inept about controlling such engines. They do not go in for either class conflicts or race conflicts. They avoid politics, economics, and papers on psychology. They are pure and delightful. And as soon as I possibly can, I'm going to climb back out on that good old phylogenetic limb and sit there, this time right side up and unashamed, wiggling my whiskers at all the silly, yet at the same time far too complicated spe specimens of Homo sapiens, whom I shall see strutting and fighting and messing things up down there on the ground below me. Now, Holman studies were all on operant conditioning. What about classical conditioning and its relationship to expectancy? Now, of course, uh, this is the conditioning model of placebo effects. I assume actually you're all familiar with it, so I'll go through it very quickly. You have active uh, treatment, it leads to an improvement. You pair it with the vehicle, the pill, the capsule, or so on. That comes to elicit the treatment and or by itself, even when you take the uh, unconditional stimulus away. The first studies that I know of looking at condition, conditioned enhancement of placebo effects, in this case, placebo an analgesia, was done by Nick uh, Vodouris and his colleagues in Australia starting in 1985. Uh, and again, you all know this, I'm sure, too, because that's what we now do in so many conditioning studies. You have a pain stimulus which produces pain. Uh, you use a, have a placebo cream. Uh, you pair it with surreptitious and reduction of the pain stimulus so that the person doesn't know you're reducing it and thinks they're feeling less pain. And then by doing that, uh, you get even less pain. And when you take away the surreptitious pairing of the reduction of the stimulus and bring it back up to normal levels, the placebo cream now produces even less pain, uh, more pain reduction than it would have did before. The classical, the theory of classical conditioning, the original theory coming out of Pavlov and his lab is what we call the stimulus substitution model. You have conditioning trials that automatically lead to a conditioned response. There's no cognition involved in that. But learning theorists since then have rejected that model by and large. Those who are working in the field of classical conditioning, like Robert Scorlo, who's one of the preeminent conditioning researchers, wrote a paper that was published in 1988 in American Psychologist. 
Lithium Conditioning, It's Not What You Think It Is, was the title of a scoreless paper. And he suggested that instead of the stimulus substitution model, conditioning trials produce a representation or expectancy of the unconditional stimulus. And it's that expectation of the unconditional stimulus that produces the response. Which means also that other sources of information that affect expectancies can affect the response. Here's a test of that, that, uh, uh, this, that uh, specifically with respect to uh, classical conditioning of placebo, enhancing placebo uh, effects, producing placebo responses that Guy Montgomery and I published in 1997. We had three groups, um, experimental pain. We have a control group where nothing is done. We have a surreptitious pairing, standard classical condition, uh, conditioning paradigm where the stimulus is lower during conditional conditioning trials without the person knowing that the stimulus intensity is the pain intensity is being lowered. And then we have an informed pairing condition in which we do the same thing as doing any other conditioning procedure, the same thing we did in the surreptitious pairing, except we inform people that during the pairing trials, we are going to lower the intensity, we're lowering the intensity of the stimulus. Then we have the test trials with stimulation put up to normal levels. What happens? And here's what happens. The conditioned effect, conditioning effect, was obliterated completely, as you can see. Furthermore, the correlation between pain and expectancy in that study was a nice, high, robust 0.7, very, very large correlation. Um, we also looked at what happened in these groups. Uh, when we added expectancy ratings as a covariate in the analysis, control, when that's controlled, the differences between the control condition and both surreptitious and informed conditioning uh, conditions disappeared completely. In fact, uh, the control group did a little better but not, although not significantly so. Now, there are two types of expectancy that I have identified in the literature for many, many years. One is stimulus expectancies and the other is response expectancies. Stimulus expectancies are anticipations of external events. Response expectancies, so it's like, for example, the pain stimulus will be less intense. Response expectancies, are predictions of whether one's own non-volitional responses to events. For example, I will feel less pain. Why is this distinction important? Well, here's an example of its importance from a study uh, published by Schenck and his colleagues in 2017. And what they did was conditioning to color cues so that one color cue meant that the, uh, well, what it meant depended on which condition they were in. In one condition, uh, it was a stimulus expectancy. They were told that um, the color cues would indicate whether a high or low stimulus would be a high intensity pain stimulus or a low intensity pain stimulus will be uh, administered. Said they were. The subjects were told the temperature will be reduced with one or the other light without being told which light it would be until the conditioning procedure informs them of that. The response expectancy condition, the person was told, a TENS treatment will be applied and will reduce your pain during some of the trials and color will indicate whether the TENS treatment is on or not. And of course, they're not told which color is going to indicate that or not, and then they go through the conditioning experience. Pain reduction after 
being given a stimulus, inducing a stimulus in expectancy, and that uh, following a response expectancy conditioning procedure. And that's a significant difference. And here's what, how that happens. What you see is you know, with the response expectancy during the conditioning trials, uh, which in this case is shown with the green uh, line during the conditioning trials, the person rapidly develops an expectancy for less pain. And during the extinction trials where the pain level, where the intensity levels are brought up to the same level, there's uh, very slow extinction. As you can see, a little bit of increased pain, but it remains much lower than um, in, with, the, with the other color. What about with stimulus expectancies? With the stimulus expectancies, you'll see there's the same initial lowering of the pain intensity. That's because you've lowered the, actually lowered the pain intensity. <clears throat> and so they develop the expectancy. There's that, but it very rapidly extinguishes and becomes a non-significant difference when what they are, are taught is that what the colors are, are communicating is a difference in the um, intensity level of the stimulus itself. So that indicates a methodological problem. Studies of conditioned stimulus expectancies are not placebo studies, I am arguing. If they were, then all conditioning studies would be placebo studies. And that would be the first placebo study, the study of uh, teaching dogs to salivate through a, a conditioning uh, procedure. And in that case, there are thousands upon thousands of what we would have to call placebo studies, starting all the way back with Pavlov, that don't mention placebos and that are ignored by us when we look for the literature and describe the literature on uh, placebo effects. An example of it, classical conditioning and pain, conditioned analgesia and hyperanalgesia. Back in 1914, no mention of placebo at all. So we would call, classify that as a uh, placebo study. If these are placebo studies, then when we're doing our reviews of conditioning and placebos, why are we ignoring the vast majority of these studies? My uh, methodolog methodological recommendation that comes from this concern is that when we want to uh, study placebos, we can be informed by conditioning studies that don't involve placebos, that involve anything at all. Uh, but if we want to uh, uh, do a, a study that most directly relates to what happens when you give someone a placebo, that is a treatment, uh, uh, a sham treatment, uh, is that we should do so manipulating treatment expectancies and not stimulus expectancies. Let's talk for a little bit about hope. A um, number of researchers have suggested that hope um, is also an important component uh, of what we call the placebo effect and one of the important determinants of it. Problem is, that hope is a somewhat ambiguous term. There are two definitions for it in the Oxford English Dictionary. One is as a noun, which is an expectation and desire for something to happen. And what you'll notice is that we can't, if when we use that definition, which is very, very common um, for, for hope, uh, I am hopeful, I have hope, um, it involves both the expectation and the desire. And so it's confounded already with expectation. We can't say expectation versus hope because 
Hope includes expectation by that definition. As a verb, on the other hand, it's defined, hope is defined as to want something to happen independently of uh, uh, what will happen. I want it to happen, but I don't expect it will. A non-ambiguous alternative is to use the term desire instead of hope. And there is historical um, precedent for that as well. Don Price, uh, way early on, back starting back in 1984, talked about placebo effects as being driven by expectancy, the expectancy that something will occur and the desire that something will occur. And so he used the term desire, which is much less ambiguous in the same way that more recently we talk about hope. So what happens when expectancy and hope, expectancy and desire are in opposite directions? What happens is we get the nocebo effect. I don't want it to happen, but I think it will. And the very existence of the nocebo effect suggests that expectancy can override desire. I don't can't think that many of the subjects in our experiments want the uh, nocebo effect to occur, want the uh, negative outcome to occur, and yet it does. Now, if expectancy and desire are both um, uh, part of what predicts placebo and nocebo effects, then nocebo effects should be weaker than placebo effects. Don't have enough studies of it, but here's one that we do have. It was a within subject study in which people were at one point given a placebo, which was labeled lidocaine, or a nocebo, which was labeled caps, uh, caps, capsaicin, uh, capsaicin or a neutral stimulus, which was described as a moisturizing uh, uh, cream. In all cases, it was in fact the same moisturizing cream. And here's what happened with the lidocaine label. You get this big reduction in pain. With the capsaicin, you get a increase in pain. In the neutral condition, you get basically nothing. What you'll notice is that the lidocaine effect on um, reduced pain is larger than the placebo capsaicin effect of uh, increasing pain. So based on that, a methodological recommendation is manipulate treatment expectancies rather than stimulus expectancies to get the most accurate information about the placebo effect. Here's another methodological recommendation, and that is to measure desires and expectations prospectively rather than retroactively, or at least in addition to measuring them uh, retroactively. Um, Rosenjar et al. Uh, wrote a very recent uh, article referring back and getting more data from an earlier study that this had been done in the same lab in uh, uh, Lena uh, Vesa's lab in Denmark. What they included both pre measures of expectancy, prospective expectations, measure the way we usually do. The correlation with uh, chronic pain uh, was uh, uh, the placebo effect in chronic pain, pain reduction was big healthy 0.62. They also asked people to report on their experience at the end of the study. Interestingly, only expectations were only mentioned spontaneously six times. So uh, we should 
measure them uh, prospectively to get the most accurate uh, results. You can get very, very different uh, uh, results uh, and use a, a, a measure where we ask about it specifically. Here's one more methodological recommendation, and, and it's independent of the um, things I've talked about right now, because it applies not only to um, uh, placebo studies, but to actually all uh, research studies. Um, and that is, do not categorize continuous data. We do it all the time. Everyone does it. Uh, for example, we look at people's response, how much pain reduction was there. And if it's more than a certain amount, they're called responders. And if it's less than a certain amount, they're called non-responders. And we look for the difference between responders and non-responders. We should not do that. And this was first pointed out by Cohen, the same cone from which we get cones D uh, as a measure of effect size back in 1983. And he pointed out that dichotomizing at the mean, between yes or no, when you have a continuous variable, that's tantamount to, it's equivalent to discarding between 38 and 60% of the data. And that's when you dichotomize at the mean, if you dichotomize at a different cutout, cutout you're discarding even more of the data. No one would want to do that. Indeed, there have been many editorials and articles published on it. Every article I've seen is saying, don't do it, it's a bad idea. Uh, an editorial was published in the British Medical Journal saying, don't dichotomize uh, continuous variables. And yet, same journal still publishes articles based on dichotomized data. To get the most accurate results, don't dichotomize. And that's my talk, and I'm open for questions.